As many of you know, I went to Ghost Ranch for a bit of educational um, training, and, uh, and as part of that, I was a part of a workshop on Sabbath, which sounds great to me, and it was on reprioritizing. And we had a teacher that was a yoga instructor and led us in gentle yoga in the morning and in the evening. And we went on a day trip to the wilderness and out to a monastery. We celebrated, we released our feelings, and we had this wonderful kind of dance party one night. It was a really wonderful experience. And I have lots of little stories from my time at Ghost Ranch. Also, if you've never been there or heard of it, it's this beautiful ranch out in the middle of nothing, which is what makes it kind of great in New Mexico. It's known for very large skies, and you get to watch as the weather comes in. It is a, a beautiful, and I would say a sacred place. Out of all of the many stories and pictures and things that came of my experience that week, the most impactful one for me was my personal journey concerning the death of my grandmother, Edith. She was in her early 90s and had been relatively healthy, yet in decline. And in May, she had a, sur a surgery and she went on hospice. And we had no reason to think, in particular, that she was close to death. Until I received that phone call that none of us wants to receive. And Ghost Ranch is known for not having good cell phone reception. And so it was a very big deal that my phone picked up that night. Now, my family history includes a pattern of me being pretty frustrated with and hurt by my grandmother. I typically refer to her as complicated. Uh-huh, yeah, that kind of sums it up. It's complicated. For instance, she mispronounced my name for 43 years. <laughs> and it always became this back and forth. She mispronounces it, my mom says, Mom, and we go from there, right? Just so you know, there's an A at the end of my name, and it's always had an A. <laughs> and it will always have an A at the end of the name, Diana. Mm -hmm. Okay. Also, just going to put it out there, no one else in our family is named Diane. No family, friends, there was no, oh, it reminds me of a, no, there was no, just a misfire. And it hurt. And it felt clear to me that she never really saw me and took the time to correct herself. I was resentful of her for many reasons. For many such instances, many a family outing, trip, story revolved around her. She was the main driver of events and always the main character, pushing not only me, but my mother to the side. And so I found myself standing on a deck at Ghost Ranch, talking with a classmate as we waited for the morning yoga to begin. I was to meet my parents the next week for vacation in Santa Fe and Albuquerque, and I hadn't seen them in over a year, and that was all disbanded. And so I said to my classmate in my disappointment and in my resentment, couldn't she have waited a week <laughs> so that I could go see my parents and have fun? And this wise woman took a, break, took a beat, and then she looked at me and she said, was your grandmother always the center of things? <laughs> mm -hmm. Paul says, rejoice always. Give thanks in all circumstances. And what a good scripture when we feel on top of the world. When we feel like, I think I can do this. When we feel like, we're doing okay, and the world around us is all right. But always and in all circumstances, probably not. That second line, pray without ceasing, 
feels a little more doable to me. Even if all I can pray is selfish. Like sometimes I'm tired of praying for understanding or wisdom or patience. Sometimes my prayers sound a little more like, please make that other person become someone I'd like to be around. (laughs) I'm sure no one in this room has ever prayed that prayer. Uh Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Because I don't always feel like giving thanks. I don't always feel like being the bigger person. I don't always always feel like being Christ-like. I don't always feel like rejoicing. And I don't think I'm unusual, I think I'm human. And the good news is that rejoicing and gratitude are not really about feelings, but they're a practice. Paul wrote this letter not to invite us to censor ourselves and pretend we only ever feel great and happy and thrilled about everything and everyone. No, because Paul is a guy who was put in jail and kicked out of town and persecuted. He is not rejoicing in pain or pretending that it's all roses and ice cream. He's not talking about feelings. Rather, he's speaking to us about creating a practice. And it is the same with stewardship. For instance, if you ask me to give my time and talents and treasure, I will probably only offer it when I feel like it. And I can tell you without hesitation that you're only going to get a few bucks out of me when I'm feeling good. Because the part where I'm sitting here and I feel great and I feel like my finances are great and I have cash in my wallet, it's a very low number of Sundays. So, in other words, <laughs> if, that's, if I'm going on feeling, I can be a terrible steward. But stewardship is not just about feelings, it's also a practice. As someone who currently practices stewardship in my finances, I decide on an amount, a tithe, and I tell the bank to send the check because I need the bank's help to make it happen. And then I let my emotions determine my special offering givings. But I make it a practice to give money to the church and to a few other nonprofits that I love on a regular basis. I practice giving my money away. I practice being generous, and that is how I have become a more generous person. They say that practicing gratitude and generosity are the keys to building a more joyful and happy life, not the other way around. Practicing builds capacity and stamina. And if we wait until we just feel like it, if you're like me, it simply will not happen. And of course, generosity is not the end. It's not the end goal, but the means to growing as followers of Jesus. These practices of generosity, rejoicing, stewardship, prayer, are how God changes us. In the intensely difficult 22, 24 hours, I had at Ghost Ranch between learning of my grandmother's downturn and her actual death. I had some time and some space to pray and to reflect. I realized that day that there are pieces of who I am, my interests, my physicality, that are tied closely to her, to her physique, to her lifelong search in God in many places and traditions, to her sly sense of humor and big laugh, to her love of art. I realized there was so much I had to be thankful for, so much I have received from my grandmother. I was able in that day, in that holy space under the vast, beautiful sky, surrounded by beautiful, loving people, to practice gratitude. The pre-planned group ritual that evening was centered in an invitation to let go of something that we were carrying. We found stones and we brought them to the meeting place and we walked silently into the arroyo 
a canyon. And I prayed and named aloud as part of our ritual that I chose to let go of my resentments. And I placed my stone on our altar alongside everyone else's. And we prayed and blessed our intentions. And then we picked up our stones and we buried them out in the sands of the arroyo. And I and many of us wept because somehow I knew in that moment that she was dying and I was sending her on her way. And we were blessing each other a thousand miles apart and yet deeply connected. God was with us in those moments in a way I cannot explain or really describe. But I told God, I told my grandmother, that I was thankful and grateful for all of the gifts that she had given me. And I wished her peace. Letting go of my resentment was a big deal. I had been carrying it around for decades. And it worked. And it is something that I still practice. I feel gratitude when I think of her. Even as I tell you about my pain and joke about how to pronounce my name, it doesn't carry that same sting. Which is not to say that the pain wasn't real or that every memory is now rosy. But it freed me from carrying that resentment. So last month, when my parents came into town for the installation, my mom brought with me a ring that my grandmother had worn. It was in her rotation. She had been a jewelry dealer and always wore multiple large rings each day. When my mom first asked me what I wanted to remember her by, I was in Santa Fe and I had been looking at all of this jewelry and I said, I'd really love a ring with one large center stone. And well, my mom brought me a couple of things, but she also brought me this one. It's a ring with one large center stone. I felt like that was a pretty good answer to that, to that prayer. And I have this faint memory of this being on my grandmother's hand. And so I've started wearing it. And I've started wearing this other ring that I found in Santa Fe. And I've been wearing them with gratitude. Something I never thought I would associate with my grandmother's memory. Gratitude can reshape us. Gratitude can lead us towards rejoicing. It is not a feeling, but a practice. My hope for our church community is that we might grow and be changed by these practices together. My hope and my trust is that giving thanks can center us and shape us in ways we might not even dare to hope for. But I also trust that there will be breakthroughs in compassion and joy that bring love from resentment. For that's the basis of our faith. Light out of darkness. And that faith changes lives of people and of families and of communities and the world as Christ is born and reborn into the world around us. So may we practice gratitude and be good stewards of our lives and our resources so that we may make space for God's light to lead us home. May it be so for you and for me.